Sure. In fact, okay, so I'll unmute you, Christina, too, then. Okay, so I have several people here. Good. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Now, we had 13 people signed up, and so far only five people have come. So I'm going to give it another minute or so. But uh, can you guys uh, see the screen and also hear my voice? Coming through clear, yeah. All right, good. And what's your first name? The guy? Yeah, I'm Jerry from Jerry. Toronto. Jerry from Toronto. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. All right, good. Huh? Good. Good. Shirley, you can see in here. Haley, you can see in here. Awesome. I'm new to this platform. And so last quarter, last month, uh, we had a snafu and it didn't work. I was, so I'm glad I learned it. <laughs> okay. Well, let's go ahead and get started because um, we've got a full hour here. And also, you know, being an Adelarian, I don't mind people, um, you know, jumping in and asking questions. That's the way we kind of work. We Adlerians do okay. because we like social connection. So it's always good to get feedback when it's coming. So anyway, um, this is about uh, clinical supervision Adlerian style. I'm the executive director here of the Indiana Counseling Association. I'm also a full-time professor for Capella University, which is an online university with a KCREP program in mental health counseling, school counseling, and marriage and family therapy. And so um, I'm fortunate to work for, for them because I've been with them for 15 years and they treat me really well. But they also like us to do other stuff outside of Capella that's related to counseling. So therefore they really like it that I'm the executive director of the Indiana Counseling Association. So I enjoy this and think this is a, a lot of fun being their executive director. Okay, so let's go, let's go to the first slide. Um, you know, depending upon your age, you know what I'm talking about there when I say the Peter Principle. Um, the Peter Principle came out in, the, in I think, in an MBA in back in business uh, business colleges back in the late '60s, and um, they came up with this guy Peter and Hole came up with this principle called the Peter Principle. And the Peter Principle is essentially this: it is um, the longer a person stays with an organization the more likely they are to be promoted to their level of incompetence. I'm going to say that again. Uh, the longer a person stays with an organization, the more likely they are to be promoted to their level of incompetence. And so do we really know what we're doing as supervisors? Because often you'll see a supervisor, just somebody who's a supervisor because they've been there longer than everybody else. And so sometimes mm -hmm. you, you've probably had supervisors who like, I don't think they know what they're doing, you know, <laughs> and, but you know, they're your supervisor. So you still have to be respectful and, and, and heed, heed their warnings. But anyway, that's just something to kind of think about. We want to have a direction with what we're doing in our supervision, clinical supervision. So here, here's a, a short, short question. You can, you can just say it out loud or you can type it into the chat box. Um, the question number one is what is the most common form of individual supervision. I'm talking about individual clinical supervision or counseling supervision. What do you think is the most common form of individual supervision? Developmental, okay, good, good one, Haley. Any other ideas? Watching, okay, <laughs> yeah. Good, Shirley. Person focused. Good, Laura. And Laura Hopper is here. She is one of my supervisees. We just terminated our supervision relationship just last week. And it's been a pleasure being her supervisor. She is now graduated and she's moving on into the world of professional counseling. So thanks, Laura. Um, well, this is a trick question. Uh, the most common form of individual supervision is no supervision. Isn't that amazing? If you look at if you look at the statistics, the most common form of individual supervision is no supervision. Okay, so that leads to the second question. Then, 
What is the second most common form of individual supervision? It should give you a clue from the answer to the first one. What is the second most common mm. form of individual supervision? If I said, you know, reactive, uh, when I was a supervisor, it was a crisis presents itself and I have to react. Yep. And it's sort of not, not preemptive or not structured. It's just reactive, if that makes any sense. Yep. Yeah. And I think that's pretty, pretty close to that. That fits into the category of, of the answer. Uh, the answer is kind of a, an unstructured periodic supervision, you know? And so that would definitely fit in as reactive. But yeah, Christina has a good answer. Self supervision. <laughs> yeah, that's unfortunately that's uh, that's the answer to number one. Uh, Self supervision, no supervision. But the second most common form of individual supervision is a periodic, sporadic, not structured supervision. You're like, hey, you know, I, I'm kind of hungry. Let's go grab lunch together and talk about cases. Or, you know, um, I'm sorry, I've got an emergency I have to take care of. I need to cancel our supervision for today. You know, those kinds of things um, are the most second most common form of uh, individual supervision. So Haley's saying that rings true to her. So that's good. And Haley, you're an Adlerian professor, so it's nice to know that uh, I'm on the right track. Okay, so then let's get to the different types of supervision. And already, you know, um, Haley's mentioned uh, one of the models. The first model of supervision is developmental model. And this is where... It starts out with more direction and you gradually release control so the supervisee becomes more autonomous. So developmental, you know, a lot of hand holding at first and then as they mature and develop in their, in their profession, in the program, or if they're going for licensure, you're doing state hours, you know, as they get further along, they need less and less control and it becomes more of a collegial type of thing. So a developmental model. The second one is a discrimination model. And this focuses on skill and functioning level. You know, the supervisee may need to be a teacher. Say, let's learn this skill. Let me teach you about, you know, systematic desensitization. Or they may need to help the counselor um, explore some internal dynamics. You know, so that'd be self-exploration. Or uh, the supervisor may need to just get some resources, be a consultant. So that's a discrimination model. Uh, the third model is a cognitive model, an interpersonal process recall. And that's just one example of a cognitive model. I mean, there can be several. And there's several developmental models, discrimination models, too. But I'm just kind of giving an example of each. So in the cognitive model, interpersonal process recall model, this came out of the University of Michigan. And in this one, you record the session. And then you review the session with your supervisee. And you stop the session every so often to sit, find out what they're thinking, you know, about what's going on in the, se in the session. And so, like, I had one student, uh, one intern, you do a lot of face touches during the session, you know, and it seemed to me to be a little excessive. And so I stopped it for a little bit. And I said, tell me what's going on in your mind right now. And he said, you know, I'm thinking I have a really big nose. So that was interpersonal process recall. That was a cognitive model. I'm trying to get at what he's thinking. Obviously, he wasn't tuned into the session. He was thinking he was more self-focused. And I wouldn't have found that out if I hadn't used the interpersonal process recall with him. And then the fourth one is a psychodynamic model, uh, which is relational dynamics, uh, parallel process. And I don't think parallel process gets enough attention. I really like parallel process. And parallel process is simply the idea that the way that I treat the supervisee is the way the supervisee is going to treat the client. And it goes the other direction, too. The way the client treats the supervisee is the way the supervisee is going to treat me. So it's a two-way process, the parallel process is. And so to pay attention to the dynamic between you and your supervisee also gives you um, clues about how they get along with their, with their client and also gives you clues about how the client gets along with them and the way that you and your supervisee get along. Okay, so here's the next question. Next this question here. Um, you know, of these four models, and we're talking about Adlerian supervision, of these four models, which one or ones do you think that an Adlerian would use? What do you guys think? 
there's room for all four, probably. Ah, good. Jeff, Jerry, yeah. that was a trick question, and you got it right. So okay. an, Ad, an Adlerian will use all four. It, an Adlerian um, can use all four, but also Adlerian supervision is none of those, too. So it's all and none hmm. at the same time. And so I want to get you into Adlerian supervision here a little bit. So any questions before I move on to the next screen? All right, okay, let's go on. Okay, so Adlerian supervision, oops, has four phases. Okay, so these are the four phases of Adlerian supervision. First is you and your supervisee need to establish an egalitarian relationship that involves trust, warmth, and personal interest in their development. And they're interested in your development too. So obviously we need to establish a warm, trusting relationship. The second one is to assess and understand the supervisees and the client's perceptual views. And there's a number of ways we might do that and we'll talk about that a little bit later. The third one is helping develop insight through the interpretation of the supervisees as well as clients' behavior. So helping the supervisee develop insight and we interpret. So Adlerians, we're not afraid to interpret and we're not afraid to be wrong when we interpret because even if we're wrong, we're still getting information. So we may interpret behavior. Mm -hmm. The fourth thing is we uh, have a reorientation focusing on the development of a systemic plan of supervision using encouragement and correcting faulty perceptions of the supervisee's self. And so one of our goals then as an athlete supervisor in the final phase is to help them develop a plan and we need to use encouragement and correct any faulty perceptions they may have. So that kind of gives you an idea of where we're going. So what are some of the supervisor behaviors you need to exhibit if you're doing Adlerian supervision? Okay, so we need to be a dynamic consultant. You know, um, Adlerians, we believe that, you know, counseling and supervision is not just sit there and tell me everything, um, you know, tell me, and, and we're, just, we're just essentially silent the whole time. We don't believe that. We believe that this is an interchange, that this is a, a social occurrence that's going on, and that we want to um, um, be involved with our supervisee. Now, now, Jerry, I think you're making extra noise. I think it's you, but I'm not sure. Just, uh, I don't know, can you hit, maybe hit mute on your phone? Maybe? Yeah, you, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm done now. Finish the noise. Uh, oh, okay, no problem. No problem at all. Okay, the second one is we want to explore the supervisee's lifestyle and thinking. Okay, so we may ask a supervisee, you know, about some of their uh, early, early things that happened to them. That's how we kind of understand a, super, a supervisee's lifestyle. Let me give you an example from my own life. Um, I was young, probably, I'd say, this is an early, very early, a very early recollection that I had. Um, I would say I was probably maybe five or six. And we were, we were um, my dad is a pastor, and he would, he would travel to different prisoners' homes, I mean, to different, different churches, and then prisoners would invite us over to their house for lunch after after church. So we would, so me and my two, my four siblings, we would get to experience all different kinds of things on Sunday afternoon. And so we, I remember we were invited to this one prisoner's home. It was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And they had, they had a swimming pool and this swimming, and it was so hot that day. And that swimming pool looked so good. I remember sitting on the edge of that pool and I remember seeing my brother dive off the diving board. My sisters are talking you know, uh, my other brother, I don't know where he is, but I'm sitting at the edge of this pool. And, you know, on some pools, there's kind of like a semicircle of steps that go down into a pool. And I haven't had a lot of experience with swimming or pools or anything. So I stood on the edge of this edge of this step. I got up and stood on this edge of the step, and I just gradually walked down these steps. And next thing I knew, I was in over my head. I was looking up, and I didn't know what to do. I could just see, I could see the water there. And then my sister dived in, and she pulled me up and set me on on the edge of the uh, on the edge of the pool. And I'm like sputtering, and I'm like, "Man, what happened? I didn't I did I didn't have a framework for it, and so I didn't know what happened." So now, if you were my supervisee, 
there could be, I mean, if you were my supervisor, excuse me, um, you could, you could uh, draw a number of conclusions from that early recollection. And one uh, might be that um, um, you see me as maybe a dependent person. When Dale gets in over his head, he expects other people to bail him out. You know, that could be one conclusion you could make as a supervisor about my early recollection. And so then that might be something you might want to keep in the back of your mind if I was your supervisee. You know, does he seem to come to me excessively when there's things that maybe he needs to handle on his own, you know, type of thing? Does he only come to me when he is in over his head, you know? And so those kinds of things. So that, that you would explore a supervisee's lifestyle uh, with some early recollections. And, but you have, to remember, you have to remember you are not the counselor, okay? You're not there to do counseling. You are there solely as a supervisor. So, okay, this, I see other people are, ch are coming in. That's good. Yes, um, Haley, yes, I will, I will be sending an email out after this to all the attendees. And on that email will be these slides, also be a CEU for uh, one hour of supervision training. And somebody has their, has their uh, speakers on. They need to go on here. On. They need to go on here. If you have your speakers on, please go on mute. If you have your speakers on, please go on mute. And, um, and um, also, also Haley. Also Haley. Okay. Somebody's speaker is wrong. Could you put your speaker on mute? Oh, good. You did. Thank you. All right. And also, Haley, um, I'll also be sending a link to, for feedback because I want to get feedback about how this went and so I can always do better in it next time. And so, okay, the third one is you want to provide encouragement to supervisees. And you know what encouragement does? That inspires a supervisee to find solutions to cope with any predicament, you know? And so if we encourage them to try, try things, you know, try it and see what happens, then uh, it'll do number four. It'll still courage in them to try new techniques. And so you might say to them, hey, I want you to try, you know, uh, a little bit of mindfulness here because, you know, Adler's, Adler was uh, an early person in mindfulness. He said, you know, chew on a thought like you chew on a piece of a spearmint gum. You know, that's a mindfulness statement. So I want you to try some mindfulness with this next client. See, so if we're encouraging them, that will still courage in them to try new techniques. And then the fifth thing is that we need to be as a supervisor is to be reflective and honest. You know, so we need to, they need to know that when they speak with us, we're going to speak honestly to them. And then the sixth one, which is Adlerian through and through, is you've got to model the courage to be imperfect. You know, I'm sorry I missed that form that you wanted me to sign, Supervisee. Um, I, I got tied up in that, and I just simply forgot. I apologize. Let me make it right. You know, did you sign the form? Instead of saying to the Supervisee, well, you know, you should have had that in by such and such a date, you know, or you should let me know that I'm supposed to sign this, those types of things. Instead of blaming the Supervisee, you have to own what you did and say, I'm sorry, I, I messed up. I'm going to try to make it right. So does that make sense? So supervisor behaviors for you guys? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Okay, so now this comes from Betty Bettner. And if you've been around um, Adlerian theory much, you know Betty Bettner. And what's really cool is this summer, I Cassie, I Cassie came down here to Indianapolis where you know I live, down here in Indianapolis. I Cassie, if you don't know what it is, and it'll be at the end of these slides, is a two-week kind of uh, Adler camp, and they do it internationally. And every five years, they come to the United States. And this time, they came down to Butler University in Indianapolis. So that's right, Betty Bettner came to Butler. You know, so so if you like alliteration, you would have enjoyed that joke just there. So anyway, she has yeah. the, she has the four C's, and this is from Betty Bettner at Butler. And this has been adapted to supervision. And so here she says, um, here she says, um, there are four things, the four C's that's going to happen to your supervisee if you do, uh, if you, if you do at learning supervision. And these are going to be briefly stated and then we'll go back through them. The first one is connected. You know, they're going to make meaningful connections with a supervisor and client. Let me make sure I'm doing it right. Yeah, I am. And the second one is they're going to believe that they count. They're going to believe that what they do has meaning. Thirdly, they're going to feel capable, successful. And fourth, they're going to have courage. They're going to take risks for supervising and client growth. 
So this is this is Betty Bettner all the way through. She's awesome. Uh, if you've met Betty Bettner, she just makes you feel like you're her best friend. So instilling connection is the first thing we need to do. And so here's how you instill connection, supervisee. We provide opportunities for professional development. We say, hey, I'm going to go to this training, and I think it might be really interesting for you. Why don't we go to this training together? You know, or here's a train. I know that you'd be interested. I want you to go to this train. Tell me, and I want you to come back and tell me how it would fit for you. You know, those kinds of things. So professional development. The second one is it provides, you provide positive attention by actively setting up supervision times. So you don't want to fall back into the uh, most popular form of supervision, which is, well, the second most popular, which is, I hey, will meet when, when it's convenient for me, you know. No, instead, you make supervision a priority. And so you're making supervision a priority for your supervisee, giving them that positive attention. It's just you and me during the supervision session, and you can see how that's going to instill connection with your supervisee. And the third one is a supervisor shows acceptance, separating the deed from the doer. Now, you know, uh, supervisees make rookie mistakes. And we, what we don't want to do is say, because you made the mistake, you're a bad counselor. That's just not what we want to do. Let me give you an example of a counselee that I had uh, that made a rookie mistake. This guy, um, he was in group counseling, leading group counseling, and he had a headache. And so he, and this was a group counseling for um, people who were in recovery. He had a headache, so he pulled out a pill bottle out of his pocket, uh, popped a pill in his mouth, took a drink, swallowed down, put the pill bottle back. Well, uh, the, the supervisee is like, what in the world did you just do? You know, obviously the supervisor didn't bring it up in group, but in supervision said, what did you just do? I mean, this is a group of people in recovery and you're taking drugs in front of them. And he's like, oh man, I didn't even think of that, you know? And so there's some options you can do with that. You can berate this guy and say, you know, that's just, you're, you're stupid. Why did why'd you do that? You know, or you can say, okay, we learned something there. Maybe you weren't focusing on what's going on in the, in the group. And so, well, what did you learn from this? And he's like, well, you know, I, I learned that maybe I need to think about everything that I do when I'm leading a group. And so that was a good learning experience for him. So he, we separated the deed from the doer in that, in that instance. Okay, let's go to the next one. Feel free to jump in if you have questions or comments. The second thing that Betty Bettner says we need to do is instill feelings of counting. You know, that the, what the supervisee does uh, is important. So we need to demonstrate um, where, their, where the counselor, our supervisee, contributes to client's growth. So we need to show them, hey, look at what you did here. Um, look how, how you brought the client forward by what you did. And so you know, what you're doing makes sense. The second thing is having the supervisee be a consultant contributing to the growth of peers. So for example, let's say you have two or three supervisees one supervisor is really good at gestalt techniques. Another one's really good at CBT. And you're saying, hey, you know, I think you need to go talk to uh, Jim Bob over here who's really good at gestalt stuff and ask him about how he might do that in this situation, in this case. And so what you're doing is you're allowing your supervisees to supervise each other, contributing to the growth of each other. And so you see that that instills feelings of counting. So, and here's a, here's a controversial thing about some supervisors will not ask a supervisee for a consultation. Now, at Lurians, we don't have no trouble doing that because we believe in egalitarian relationships. But some supervisors might have trouble with that. But it's okay to ask your supervisee, hmm, I'm not quite sure I know as much about that as you do. Could you kind of advise me a little bit on this situation? You know, maybe ask them about a case of yours and see how that goes. And the third thing that you want to do to instill feelings of counting in your supervisees is to refer some of your own clients to them. You know, say, I got this case here that I think would be really good for you, and I think you could do really well with this case. I want you to take this case over for me. And so what does that do to a supervisee? What, my supervisor wants me to take this case over for them? Wow, they must really believe in what I'm doing. So you can see how that, how that grows those feelings of, of what I do is really important. Then the fourth thing is offering recognitions and rewards. 
and you know you got to do that the way that that fits your style and also fits you know make sure you're not doing anything illegal or anything like that you're offering them too much but give them recognitions you know in staff meetings hey they they did really good on this case i wanted to let you guys know how well they did so those kinds of things are things that we can do to instill these feelings in our supervisees so i think betty bettner's on to something here <clears throat> Now, the second one is instilling feelings of being capable. So each mistake a supervisee makes is a learning experience. That's, that's what mistakes are for, is to learn. You know, if we don't ever make mistakes, we never learn. And everybody makes mistakes. So it's okay to learn. So making mistakes is a normative behavior. Everybody makes mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. I'm going to make mistakes. And so that's just normal behavior. And what are we going to learn from it? But then also... We want to focus on the supervisee's strengths. You know, uh, an editing theme is to help people to exploit their strengths and then work on, on their challenges. You know, so what your supervisee is good at, you know, help them build confidence in, in their themselves by saying, man, you're so awesome at this. I like the way you did this, the way you handled this. So you can see that instills feelings of being capable. Okay, let's go on. The third thing is to instill courage in our supervisees. And this is to help the supervisee find the courage to be imperfect and to accept others and their imperfection. I mean, that's Adler through and through. That's almost a quote from him, but he is, it's not exactly what he said uh, because he said it in German. But when it's translated, it's not quite his quote either, but it's pretty close. So he said, I am imperfect and I will accept you and your imperfection. And so that's what we need to help supervisees is find the courage to be imperfect so that they have opportunities. They come to you and say, you know, supervisor, I think I made a mistake here. I'd like to discuss it with you. And that they don't feel like they're going to be castigated for making a mistake. You know, that the, the, so it, it builds a, a relationship where they can come to you about anything, the good and the bad. Also, what we don't want to do as supervisors is compare supervisees. We don't want to say, you know, rank them, you know, this, you need, you'd learn a lot from, uh, you know, Bubba over here. He's just a much better counselor than you are type of thing. You know, you don't want to do that. And also, the third thing is we need to communicate genuine expressions of caring and interest while avoiding criticism. And so we need to be really interested in our supervisees and that we genuinely care about them. And that we're not critical. We're not a critical person. doesn't mean that we can't provide constructive criticism. But when they see us, when they have interactions with us, that we're not critical. I'll tell you an experience I had. I was working on a Department of Defense contract. And I was over, in a, uh, over at Ramstein, Germany, at the Ramstein Air Force Base. And I was talking to one of the supervisors there. And we were talking about how she does supervision. This is clinical supervision of her counselors. And what she said to me was, for me, was alarming. Uh, she said, this is what I do. I go, uh, when I go to see my counselor, and they're sitting next to their files, I run my hand back and forth over these files and kind of just kind of, and the ones that they, they, get, they seem nervous about, that's the ones I pull so I can, so I can catch them. You know, and that was almost a word for word what she said. And for me as an Adlerian, that was so foreign to the way that I do uh, supervision. You know, she was, a, she was playing gotcha supervision. I'm going to find out what you're doing wrong, and I'm going to nail you to the wall <clears throat> for what you do wrong. You know, and you know, maybe that's a military style, Air Force style. I don't know. You know, uh, maybe she was compensating. That's what we Adlerians always think. Maybe she's compensating for something. You know, but... For me, that was that would have made me uncomfortable to treat a supervisee like that. I didn't I didn't retort or anything like that because she had a different style. She didn't have that variant style, but uh, it just is. It, I made note of it, and so it was just interesting. So instilling courage. So what are you guys thinking so far? Are you are you are you liking this Adlerian stuff? Very egalitarian, very mm -hmm. democratic, very mm -hmm. supportive, encouraging. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, um, one thing to kind of think about Adler is he's pretty groundbreaking. Uh, he's very uh, foundational to almost every theory that's out there. Um, you know, just a little bit of background about Adler. 
um, he was the first president of the Psychoanalytic Society in Vienna. You know, so this is the Psychoanalytic Society that Freud started. He was the first president. And somewhere along the line, there was a rift between them. And so they kind of parted ways. And if you read some of the Adler stuff, you'll see that um, he uses uh, Freudian terms sometimes, but he uses them in a different way than Freud does. And I don't know if he did that on purpose just to irritate Adler, I mean, Freud, or that's the way it was. But um, one of Adler's first experiences, first early childhood experiences, was he was in bed with his brother. And he was very young, both of them were, and his brother died while in bed with him. And he recalls the doctor saying, you know, uh, uh, Alfred's going to be dead by morning. <clears throat> and, and that just, and that kind of started his theory of compensation, you know, inferiority, that kind of idea. And so that's why he became a physician. And what's interesting, he became an ophthalmologist. And if you know German, Adler is German for eagle. And eagles have terrific eyesight. So you think, man, that's a perfect occupation for a guy named Adler uh, to be an ophthalmologist. But he did, he did uh, study neurology and psychiatry and, and went into that. And he, he developed his theory while uh, as a medic in World War I, uh, while Freud was developing his theory there in Austria in his office. And so you could, see, you could see some of the things because Adler you know, says everybody's striving for power. So you can kind of see that. You know, and if you were a medic in, in World War I, I, I think that'd be very important. But uh, Freud noted that Adler's brother uh, died in bed with him. The Adler's brother's first name was Sigmund, the same name as Freud, Sigmund Freud. And so uh, you can bet that uh, Freud thought there is some, uh, something going on there for Adler, between Adler and him because of that. But getting to some of the theories, you know, um, Ellis was a member of the Adlerian Society. He's kind of like Adler on steroids, you know, um, his REBT. You can see a lot of cognitive behavioral stuff in Adler's theory. Um, uh, and I mentioned mindfulness before. You see his narrative theory uh, in, in Adler's writings. Also, um, you know, she doesn't give him credit for this Carol Gilligan and her feminist theory. She doesn't give him credit and, you know, um, I'm not going to take any credit away from her uh, saying that Adler came up with concepts that she did before she did. But, um, you know, his wife was the leader of the Communist Party in Austria. And so you can kind of see how he incorporated some of these ideas of egalitarianism. But then he also then went a little bit further and made a democracy. He believed that democracies work better than, than uh, communism. But you can see how his wife shaped his theory, too. So if you want to know the foundation of most theories that are out there, I encourage you to read some early Adlerian writings, Adler writings, because you know, I think you'll see a lot of it in there. Um, but that's enough of my um, highlight of my hero, Alfred. So, okay. so how do you improve your supervision style? Um, and here's one example that an Adlerian might use. But before I present this example to you, um, let me share with you just a little bit. Now, you know they've done meta-studies of what makes change in counseling. You know, these meta-studies, and meta-studies are studies of studies. So they've done these meta-studies that have studied studies. And these meta-studies show that in cha the change in counseling occurs in four different areas. The first area is placebo. Okay, so it's just a matter of the clients thinks they're going to get better because they're in counseling. In fact, research shows that a person feels better just when they make their initial appointment with the counselor. They, 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 in fact, it even starts before then. When they decide, I'm going to go see a counselor, they're already starting to be, feel better. That's the 15% right there of the, the placebo. Okay, so 15%. Now, 30%, and these, these percentages are not uh, set in stone because there are different meta studies, but these four factors are always there. 30%, approximately 30%, has to do with client factors. That's nothing that you can do anything about. You know, maybe they have, have a supportive grandmother. Maybe they had a flat tire on the way of the session and they're in a really bad mood. You know, those are something you just can't do anything about, the 30% there. So 
So we've got 15%, 30%. Now there's another 15%. And what's unfortunate, this is where we put all of our money. And and 15% is your your technique or your theory. So your ability to pull off your theory, 15%. I find that is so fascinating that it's so small. Maybe it's because I'm an Adlerian and we, we think it's much bigger than 15%. But because we really believe in our theory. But, but uh, the research shows that it's called a dodo bird verdict. Um, I don't know if you remember the dodo bird from Alice, um, you know, Alice in Wonderland. Um, the, the dodo bird sets up a race uh, in there and declares everybody a winner you know, in this race. And, and that's, who, that's what research shows is that really there's no theory better than others. Now, I disagree with that, but, but that's what the research shows. So that's approximately fifteen uh, percent there. So that remains forty percent. Forty percent is what is left um, that makes change in counseling, and that forty percent is the relationship, the ability of the counselor to make a relationship, a therapeutic relationship, or therapeutic alliance, whatever word you want to use, with the client. Okay, so that's and that just fits Adlerian theory so great because. That's exactly where we are. We spend a lot of our time doing that. In fact, sometimes even an Adlerian may not even look at a case. And in fact, Adler did this himself. He didn't even look at cases that the research, the, 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 what previous counselors have done when he would consult on a case. But what we look at sometimes is just how does a supervisee connect with us as supervisors? How, do they, how is that connection done. If that connection goes well, chances are that's going to go well in the counseling session. I remember I got a job one time right out of my master's program and very short interview. And one of the qu chief questions the guy asked me was, you know, what's your, what's your ability to make relationships? I didn't know about this, um, this meta study stuff going on, these four factors. And, um, he said, do you still have friends like from when you were a kid? And, you know, I'm like, yeah, I do. And he says, are friendships really important to you? Do you work hard at them to keep friends? And I said, yeah, I do. I said, friendships are really important to me. When I make a friend, they're like a friend for life, you know. And he hired me based upon my answers to that question, which I thought was really interesting because he knew about this 40%. So if you look at this, you have 40% if you have a good relationship going on, 15% placebo, 15% because you're well-trained in your theory. And so what is that? That's 70% you're ahead right there if you can do those three things. The 30% you can't do much about the client factors. and But 70% you're ahead of the game right there uh, when you're meeting with somebody. So that's been extrapolated in Wayne Wright's um, dissertation that he did out of Leeds University in England. And Wainwright came up with this Leeds Alliance and Supervision Scale. And it's based upon these meta studies that what makes a good supervisor, supervisee relationship is an alliance. You know, a working alliance, a clinical alliance, alliance whatever you want to call it. We're working together to, um, to make things go better for you as a supervisor and supervisee. Me. So here we go. Here is a Leeds Alliance and Supervision Scale, and I'll be sending this out so you have a copy of it. Um, and this stuff comes from um, uh, Miller and Duncan and, and Sparks, Jacqueline Sparks, Scott Miller, and Barry Duncan. Uh, they used to all three be together, but now I think they've they, in, a, in the in the International Center for Clinical Excellence. I think they broke up and went their separate ways. But you can find this in, in a book called. Um, the heroic client. Let me put that in in the chat box. Uh, the heroic client, and they set it up first by talking about how do you measure this in the counseling relationship, and then they take it a little bit further and how do you measure this in supervision. Okay, so what this scale is, you present the scale at the end of your supervision session each time. Okay. And you wouldn't do it right at the end because you don't want to make it just an academic exercise. You want to present it about 15 minutes before the session is over. And what this scale does, it allows you to measure how well that session went for your, you and your supervisee. And so um, 
these are 10 centimeter scales and they just mark an X somewhere on that scale about how they feel. So for example, if you can't read it, the first one says approach. On the left side, it says the supervision session was not focused. On the right side, it says the supervision was focused. And then the second one has a relationship and it says on the left side, my supervisor and I did not understand each other in this session. And on the right, it says my supervisor and I understood each other in this session. And then the third one on the left side is the supervision session was not helpful to me. And then on the right side, the supervision session was helpful to me. And they just put an X somewhere on each of those lines. And because they're 10 centimeters in length, that means that you can measure those. Okay? So you would get them. There would be a maximum score of 30 on this if everything was perfect. And a bottom score of zero. So... Any, this, this page then will be scored anywhere from 0 to 30. And let's say that um, in the session, you know, the approach was 9, meeting my needs was 9, but the relationship was 7. And so what that does is that allows us then to have opportunity to discuss where the supervisee thought we, they needed the most help or where they thought the session was most efficient. And so I'd say to them, I see here that you didn't feel like uh, like we understood each other as well as we could have. What could I do or what can we do together in this session to help us understand each other better? Okay, what does that sound like? That sounds like solution focus, doesn't it? And uh, so and Adler had a lot of solution focus in his theory too. And so this fits right along with Adlerian theory. And so this is super important because then you can chart it. So each session you see this session, you can chart it and you can know if there's ups or downs. And sometimes scores are bad because the supervisor is just having a horrible day. Or maybe you're even having a horrible day. You know, I, for example, I had one supervisee who scored low on, who scored the session low as it was not focused. And so, you know, towards the end of the session, I was talking to her about this. You know, he said, you scored this low that you didn't feel like the session was focused. And she said, well, you know, Dr. Wayman, when you said such and such, I think when I said such and such about this case, you didn't really provide me much feedback. It seemed like you kind of spaced out. And I said, and I'm, th I'm like, well, let me think about that for a little bit. You know, when you were talking about that, I was thinking about some personnel issues that were going on that, that, that's been bugging me. I, I'm sorry. I should have paid better attention there. Hey, if you see that happen again, would you say it right as you notice it? Say, hey, Dr. Wayman, I'm talking here. Listen to me. And, and, and I will also try to do better as well. And then the next session, uh, that score was up higher than it was before. You know, so so obviously we made a connection there. And would I would a normal in a normal situation would a supervisor have the courage to say that to their supervisor if they didn't have this instrument? You know, I'm kind of wondering if the supervisor would have the courage to say that. And so that's why we need to set up an atmosphere so that they can be honest on this. Now, what you don't want to do with this scale is get caught up in the numbers. Okay. You don't want to say like, okay, we had a, a 30 point session. So that was like a better session than a 27 point session. You know, you don't want to get caught up in the numbers. You just want to know this movement more than anything. And that's an Adlerian, Adlerian thing too. We are out to observe movement. And so you observe movement in the scores here. Are things going up or down? And if they drip, dip, why are they dipping? If they rise really high, why are they rising high? Is the person being honest with me? Are they just trying to snow me? You know, what's going on here? So this is really just an instrument to use to further discussion. Don't get tied into the numbers of it. Okay. Now you can do the same thing in, in uh, a counseling session too. They have two scales, the, the uh, ORS, outcome rating scale, and then the session rating scale. And those are only four points each, you know, I mean, not four points, four subjects each, but they're on the same 10 point scale and you can chart it and talk to it with your client. In fact, that's what I use in my counseling sessions. I use the, those scales, I put them back to back and the ORS, they come in. And so I know exactly what they want to talk about because they score, you know, oh, they're, how they're feeling in certain areas. And then before the session is over, I have them rate the session and then we talk about the session. You know, how did that go for you? You know, where was it deficient? What do you want to talk about next time? What's important here? And, you know, what's amazing is the number of clients and the number of supervisees that I've talked to that said, no one's ever done this with me before. 
No one's ever asked me how a session went. No one's ever asked me how a supervision session went. They just assume that it's all okay, you know? And so this is, this is really good stuff. And it's been well-researched uh, um, and it's based on good norms. And, and they have on the page where you scale it, uh, they have norms for, uh, for the ORS and SRS. He does not have norms for this in the Leeds Alliance scale. This is a dissertation study, but it's on the same theory, same idea, and I think it's just marvelous. What do you think of this idea of uh, scoring a supervision session? Are you brave enough to ask your your supervisee how they think you're doing? Yeah, Christina is. She says very helpful. Good. I've always just done this informally, never in a formal, structured mm -hmm. sort of feedback. I, I like the idea of trusting the movement. The, the numbers aren't as important as right. the the trajectory of them or the pattern of them. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And hey, Haley says she's used this some. That's good. You know, in the ORS and the SRS. Um, they, um, you have to be careful on those because that can get in the hands of pencil pushers and cause trouble. Let me give you an example. Mm. Like, uh, I believe, if I remember correctly, that the state of Arizona, the mental health counseling centers, adopted the SRS and ORS, and they tied funding into scores on the mm. session rating scale. You know, so they would be like, well, this, this agency scored higher in their session rating skills than this agency, you know, and so this agency is going to get a little bit more money because they're doing better. And so we want to do that. And so Christina uses the ORS and SRS and, and that's just a wrong use of that. So you want to be sure you don't get tied in to performance or anything like that. It's just between the counselor and the client just to discuss their relationship. And maybe you as a supervisor will look at it and kind of see what's going on there. But that's the same thing here. This is just between you and your supervisee just to continue a conversation because what we're trying to do is we're cementing the relationship. And if you got that relationship solid, you're going to have a good supervision session. So good, Christy, I'm glad, glad you guys use that. Because I really like the RS, SRS. That's what I use on my individual counseling. Okay, so let's go on. We're just about done. Now here's some, some readings for you. Um, and I will include these readings in, in the email that I send you. Uh, not all of them will be there, but the main ones that I used uh, in this presentation. But um, there's some really good stuff here uh, about Adlerian theory. Um, and most of it, uh, I, I think you're gonna, you would enjoy, you know, um, so. And then the last page, the last page is some resources that uh, you're welcome to use. Um, I run the page uh, called Indiana Adlerian Professionals on Facebook, Indiana Society of Adlerian Professionals. You're welcome to join that. You know, you don't have to live in Indiana. And I try to post something Adlerian every day. Um, there's three of us here in Indiana that kind of are the representatives to NASAP, which is the North American Society for Adlerian Psychology here in Indiana. So we, the three of us kind of share it. Uh, the three, so three of us share that page. And, um, and, uh, and we also go to the NASAP meetings and those kinds of things. Also here is also the International Committee of Adlerian Summer Schools and Institutes, ICASI. Hey, if you want to have fun, hang out for two weeks with Adlerians. I mean, it's a blast. I, I tell you, you know, um, um, they are going to be in Bonn, Germany next year. And then after that, they're going to be in Romania. And I'm not sure where they're going to be after that. But it was so much fun being with them in Indianapolis. That was the first time I'd ever experienced that. And it was just a good time. In fact, this special speaker, the person who was in charge, was, um, oh, um, I can't think of her name. Dreikers. Dreikers, uh, Rudolf Dreikers, who is a, this, the number one student of Adler, his daughter, uh, she runs this now. And so uh, Dr. Dreiker, she was there. So I got to touch her. So I got to touch somebody who's touched Adler. So I feel, I feel so much more connected with my Adlerian colleagues now. Uh, the third thing is North American Society for Adlerian Psychology. If you have any graduate students, the first year of membership is free for alfredadler.org. 
they don't have to pay anything. They won't even ask for any money. Now, the next year they will. They'll be asking for money. But um, we have a North American Society, and we have annual conferences and have regional meetings. I really encourage you, if you want to learn more about other in theory, to join that. And the National Headquarters is just up the street from me here, just 100 miles up the road at Fort Wayne, Indiana. So that's really cool. And then if you're a Twitter freak, um, I have an anonymous Twitter feed called All Adler. And it's anonymous not because I don't want you and anybody to know who I am. I just don't think it's important to know who I am because I'm trying to promote Adler. And so I try to put an Adler quote on there every day or almost every day. And so so kind of people – and now that they've, now that they've uh, made Twitter bigger, I can now put the reference. So – Hopefully, I've been able to put references uh, when people are reading readings from. But you're welcome to sign up there on Twitter, and that way then you can get uh, a uh, Adler quote every day. So I think we're at the end of our end of our training here. And before we leave, because we still have 15 minutes, no, we still have 10 minutes, and but we can quit any time. Uh, but is, are there any questions or comments or curiosities that you have? Uh, questions, comments, and curiosities. Or you can either type it in or talk it in. So I know if you're like me, you're waiting to go to lunch after this. I'm hungry. All right. Good. A lot of people showed up. That's great. We had 13 people signed up. And we had 10 here, so that's pretty awesome. Thank you so much for coming. Let me. All right. Okay. Well, I guess I'm going to close out the meeting then. I'll be sending you CEU information. If you have any trouble or you don't get it, feel free to write me. You can write me here at ICA. Um, and you can find it on our website where you signed up. And I want to thank each of you for the time that you spent sharing this hour with me. And um, best wishes to you, and hope you have a good holiday season. All right? Thanks, Dale. You bet. It was great. Yeah, have a good evening. Have a good you. afternoon. Bye. Okay. Yeah, you too. Bye.